Oh, you can press that button. All right, learn something new. <laughs> Look at us. Anyways, I'm the entertainment editor at Graphic, um, and I've been working at Graphic for about two years. Uh, I started, uh, I was a uh, print. Hello, welcome. Um, no, no, totally Just started. fine. Come on in. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I was a print and digital journalism major here. Well, not actually physically here because we didn't have this beautiful building. You guys are so lucky. <laughs> um, and I uh, studied uh, print journalism. I was very interested in uh, writing about music. I did an internship at MySpace Music. I was here, which was still a thing. Uh, and I did, then I worked at Rolling Stone, and then I worked uh, at BuzzFeed uh, for a summer intern. And uh, I was really interested in lifestyle and entertainment journalism. And when I graduated, I uh, had also a web development minor from Viterbi over there. <laughs> so that was really helpful in helping me um, become more media savvy uh, journalist and learning to build websites. And I, Graduated and a graphic reached out to me and said that hey, we want to start an editorial team uh, Would you be willing to join us? Uh, at this tech company and at first I didn't really understand how To do that and I didn't I wasn't really familiar with data. I wasn't really like a data person though uh, I like numbers and uh, And now it's two years later. Uh, I mostly work writing about the intersection of entertainment and data which a lot of people don't think go together, but um, as you'll hopefully learn later, I think that they are actually a great pair. <laughs> uh, and again, my name's Nick. Uh, I've been working at Graphic for about a year now, a little over a year. Uh, I also graduated in 2014, communication major here in Annenberg. And for the first year after graduation, I worked a few different jobs before starting at Graphic. Uh, I was a substitute teacher um, for junior high and high school. I wrote for the uh, Orange County Register covering high school sports. Um, Orange County Register is a newspaper. You guys still have those here. Um, but I knew I always wanted to be a sports writer, and so I also wrote for Bleacher Report, which is a sports website. And then in August 2015, I started at Graphic, and it's been a great ride so far, a little over a year, and happy to be here sharing our experience with data journalism with you guys. Yeah, so a little bit about what we do, what our company does. Um, graphic is a uh, tech company that basically collects data um, about a bunch of different topics. About um, here we have smartphone data, we do it about uh, politics, entertainment, sports, and then from this data, our product managers make these visualizations. So they're uh, interactive graphs, charts, heat maps, uh, and that are interactive, they have little those, uh, if you hover over a point, it'll show you a, um, a, a data point from this, um, from this data set. And then from there, our uh, product managers give, it to, give these visualizations to uh, publishers, uh, Time, Business Insider, Forbes, AP, um, so that journalists can use them uh, in their articles. They can uh, use them to either uh, bolster or give context to an article they've already written. Uh, so if they're writing a story about Apple, then they can use these as iPhone quarterly sales visualization, or it can help inform their stories. So uh, they see a, uh, a visualization about the number of earthquakes in Texas, and they from there they write uh, a new story about earthquakes in Texas over time. Uh, so they go to these publishers, and that's kind of how we get the word out and how we work with uh, different publishers for free, which is great for them. So where do we come in? We come in right about here. So we are part of our in-house editorial team. And what we do is we take these visualizations and from there we write a number of stories. Um, and so we use either data sets or visualizations um, to write uh, stories about a certain topic. And then we take these stories, using these little data visualizations here, um, we uh, write about a certain topic and then we give it to a publisher and a lot of publishers today are um, they don't have enough uh, staff or enough bandwidth to have a graphics team 
Um, and so that's really helpful for them. And also everybody wants free content. So we write good quality content with visualizations for them and we distribute it to them. So it's kind of a, uh, a little bit of marketing. So people who go on time, for example, can see an article that one of us writes, see a graphic visualization and also helps other journalists understand how to analyze a certain chart or graph and uh, how to use it in the wild. So that's a little bit about what we do. Yeah, absolutely. So Yes, they do, which is wonderful. Yeah, in the very beginning, we uh, because our we are kind of a journalistic implant inside a bigger tech organization. It was we, when we didn't get a byline, we had to kind of explain to uh, the to the the team, the distribution team that that gave our articles out. We had to say, hey, it's very important that we get our byline on here. It's not. Yeah. It's right. Exactly, but they've they are very good about it. So we have some deals with um, where we with uh, publications like we used to have one with Sports Illustrated, where we'd actually have a contributorship for them or do a column, and some they just kind of pick up in the wild and they credit us. So it's a, a really great way to disseminate our work. So these are the kinds of things that we do. So we either uh, we either ask ask one of our product managers for a visualization. We say, hey, I'd love to. Um, I saw that you already made this visualization about uh, Hollywood power couples, and I would love to use it in a story. Or, like in this case, this didn't already exist. I asked, I worked with a product manager to say, hey, I'm writing this story about Brangelina and want to measure their, uh, their star power as a couple. Let's work together and see if we can make this. So this was uh, custom made for me. And so we write rankings, kind of these lists are, um, galleries that you'll see on a lot of sites, um, but we use uh, data exclusively to make our rankings, um, and we put all of the stats on the side here, or we write deeper analysis, like uh, Nick did did here on a sports story, and then I did on a on an entertainment story. So where the where this data is going to come in here is kind of the reason why we're here, and we're here because of the quote unquote hot take that I'm sure most of you guys have heard of or are familiar with. That's um, permeated journalism. It's just the the kind of definition of a hot take. They're not sure is a a piece of opinion journalism uh, hastily written in a scolding tone. There's a just telling it like it is attitude, even if according to the best available data, it's not like that at all. So what we want to do is combat the hot take, and it's it's you can see it anywhere um, in sports journalism, which is my kind of area of expertise, so to speak. Uh, on the talking heads on TV, just kind of throwing out their opinion willy nilly. Uh, we have play-by-play -play announcers who have all the data right in front of them, yet they don't use it. Um, we have even from the, at the very top, the uh, top decision, decision makers in sports, head coaches of NFL teams, uh, they have all kinds of information the public would, would never get access to, yet they just make decisions going with their gut feeling or kind of going rolling the dice. And then, uh, of course, sports writers are very frequent to um, give out their opinions, such as uh, most, most recently, about a month ago, the Cleveland Indians beat writer um, wrote the team off, said the, the season's over, pack it in, and the Indians are now three wins away from winning the World Series. Uh, that's the problem with having a hot take in writing. It never goes away once it's out there. So <laughs> uh, what we like to do is we try to combat this um, with what we will call a smart take, which we'll get into in, in a bit. But the hot take is not just a sports problem. Uh, you can see it in entertainment media, politics media, really anything um, people kind of throw their, inf their opinions about, which is fine, uh, but if those opinions are, opinions are uninformed, then that's where you can get into a bit of hot water, and that's where we are trying to incorporate data to better guide our opinions, make sure they're informed and as objective as possible. And that's where a smart take comes in, which is what we like to brand our kind of more deeper dive analysis pieces. Um, you, can still, you can still have a strong opinion either way, but if you back it up with hard evidence, uh, then it'll just only make you have more credibility with your audience. So an example of this is uh, recently the new Ghostbusters movie came out and a lot of people were on the internet reviewing it and saying, oh, this is a terrible movie, um, it's sexist, reverse sexist maybe, and it's, uh, it's got all these problems, it's a terrible movie, and, uh, and was rated poorly, and they would you know, try to back it up by, by showing how it's rated poorly on IMDb, and so a lot of people 
a lot of readers and audiences got this overall feeling that the new Ghostbusters movie was a flop, um, that it was it was failed and it was very bad. So uh, I decided to look into this more because I saw the movie. I thought the movie was fine. Um, you know, it wasn't an Oscar contender, but um, I was interested in why there was all this, uh, all these like low reviews people were throwing out and all this hate generally. And uh, I had read actually a piece by an entertainment data writer I really like from 538 named Walt Hickey. And he had written a piece saying that there are a lot of uh, TV shows with, uh, that star women that are rated poorly by men on IMDb. And so I decided to look and see if this was the case with this movie. And in fact, it was. And it was rated very, very uh, low by men on IMDb and very, very highly by women. And so I checked to see if this was a trend across a lot of movies with female ensemble casts and, and it was the case. So I wrote a, a deep dive, call it a, an analysis about how the ratings on IMDb are very skewed towards uh, men's opinions. And uh, if you look, it's, it's very interesting if you look at the uh, movies that star men and movies that star women, ensemble cast side by side, it's women and men tend to rate uh, movies starring men the same and those starring women um, very differently. Men rate it lower and women rate it higher. So all these hot takes, all of this opinion journalism was thrown out there and with that information I decided to really, really look through it and was able to back up this uh, this this trend that I found with data. And a lot of these visualizations you'll see here are ones that I collected the data myself. I, I looked through it and I was able to, with my, uh, with my product manager, uh, make this visualization to help um, further illustrate my point. And there's lots of other examples out there of uh, media outlets doing the same type of thing. Um, this example from the Upshot, which is part of the New York Times, uh, found there was one poll that was consistently showing Donald Trump was leading Hillary Clinton. And they looked through the data that was publicly available and found that there was one uh, African-American 19-year-old male who was part of this polling sample who was, because he was the only representative in a very, very um, specific subgroup, he was weighing the results um, disproportionately hev heavily in Donald Trump's favor and this article really dove deep into that and uncovered that um, at 538 which covers sports politics entertainment um, they they use um, a analysis and data to kind of contextualize the current uh, Cleveland Indians team and stack them up against recent um, teams that had similar hot streaks in the postseason and these are just different examples of how you know some some data might be misleading. Uh, you can have an opinion about, say, the Indians say, oh, they're they're this great, or maybe they're not. And um, using data to back up those points is really going to only bolster your your end product. Yeah, and, and Nate uh, Nate Cohn, who wrote the this Upshot article here, um, was you know there there are so many, especially in this political season, there are so many people just throwing out predictions and. Uh, and using certain kinds of polls and not using others. And, and Nate really looked at this, at this particular poll that was so different from other people's polls to really, um, to really kind of look into it and figure out, okay, is there something going on here that, that uh, people should be talking about instead of just taking this poll as fact? So um, a great thing about data journalism is you're working with data and you're looking at the data, but at the same time, you're also a little bit of an investigative journalist, which is really exciting because you can illuminate a lot of new angles to stories that you wouldn't necessarily find before. So for anyone who's interested in a journalism career, how would you use data in your story? There's lots of ways to do this, but we've kind of boiled it down into two general paths you can take. Uh, the first choice is to um, look at a news issue or an event, the election, you know, the World Series, something that's going on and then um, analyze the data that's available from that event and then find an angle with that data. So that could be you know, like the example of the upshot where you know, polls are released very regularly. It's obviously a very high profile thing and 
there was an outlier present in the data from this one pool, and so the author just looked at that, dug deeper, and found an actual like a really interesting story based on that data angle that was about that news event. Uh, option two is to kind of go the opposite way, and you I, you notice a data trend. You know, you you happen to stumble upon or stumble upon some type of data that says, oh, you know, in you know in this state, you know, crime rate has spiked, you know, drastically in the past year. Um, let's dig deeper. Let's find out some causes. What could be some you know cause and effect uh, reasons for that? And that's how you, one way you can get a story out of just a data set that is just black and white, you know, very straightforward. And you notice a trend, and that from there can start a whole a whole story. So, so two examples of this um, that were done by some of our colleagues for the um, kind of first way that uh, we see you can. Uh, the first way that you can uh, approach a data story is uh, is by first kind of doing something a little bit timely, looking for a different angle around a news event. So uh, we have a colleague who runs our health site, HealthGrow. Oh, that's something I, I didn't mention. You might be. Uh, we have different uh, graphic is basically an umbrella, and every different beat, every different kind of data set, um, health, entertainment, sports, has a different website attached to it. So uh, our Nick writes for Point After, which is our sports data site, and Start Class, our education site. Yep. Uh, the entertainment site is called Pretty Famous, and then the health site is called Health Grove. And so they're all Health Grove by graphic or Pretty Famous by graphic. So that's, that is a good note. Um, anyways, so Sabrina, our colleague, uh, like many of us, was following the Olympics and was reading a lot of stories about the athletes getting ready, about doping allegations, about, uh, about uh, the, the corruption in uh, the, the Brazilian government, and said, you know, I wonder if there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting health angle to this, uh, to the Olympics that I can look at. And she decided to look a little bit more into these allegations of a very dirty water source that they had. They have a lot of uh, big big lake that they would swim in and they would uh, they would do their sailing competitions on. People were saying was uh, polluted. So Sabrina looked into the data, found that there was a data set available from AP that had that showed all of the different lagoons and the rivers around the Rio area that were polluted and wrote a little bit about that. And then she also gave people a little bit more context um, about the big issue that's not only uh, not only restricted to Rio but to around the world of uh, clean water accessibility. So, from this from this from this event, um, a lot of people were doing the same kind of stories and um, perhaps making making claims that oh you know, the water is dirty. We're not but ha not having a lot of data to back it up, and uh, she was able to kind of take out some very interesting insights um, from this data. And then the second way that you can approach this story is by noticing a trend yourself, which I find sometimes gets you the most interesting stories because it's something that you've noticed and you're probably not alone in noticing that, um, that you can try to explain, make a stab at explaining at least. And um, it's, it's a gut feeling that we have a lot. You know, you go to a, a movie, for example, like our, our, our colleague, Ben Taylor, went to the movies and noticed that he's a big movie buff and noticed that, you know, a lot of Oscar contenders have a lot of the same attributes. So I wonder if I can look through and compare all of these Oscar winners over the years and see if I can pull out any insights about what they all have in common. And from this, he found that a lot of the Academy Award Best Picture winners are about love, they are dramas, and they're usually one and a half to two hours long. And he found actually seven attributes that were all the same. So he was able to uh, take take a look through this this data, kind of uh, kind of fact check this trend that he kind of thought might have been interesting to look look deeper into, and was able to get um, an interesting story out of it. And I'm sure a lot of us have felt the same thing. Maybe you've thought. Hmm. I went to see a horror movie recently for Halloween, and it was really bad. And so I wonder, I wonder how many, 
how many like Oscar winners there are that are horror movies or I wonder how many um, if there was ever a, a peak in box office for horror movies if there's ever like the year of the horror movie or something like that you know one of these trends that really interests you that you can look a little bit more and uh, try to try to dig up some kind of story from it so you guys have seen uh, a lot of our visual visualizations and that's one of the biggest tools that you can have to supplement your writing is something data presented in a nice clean chart um, we're very lucky to have a very talented product team other writers are not so lucky uh, so we're going to show you a few examples of graphs that aren't quite as fine-tuned as ours are so we have this uh, beautiful bubble chart thing and who sees what, what what's wrong with this with this graph what's something that could be better anyone see anything a little a little off doesn't have to 100 percent there's no clear guidelines of what this is supposed to be showing uh, what's that there's no layout it's all kind of scattered it's not proportional like exactly it's not proportional you see LinkedIn 62 percent that's the biggest bubble on there and then YouTube is three percent and that's I don't really, yeah. I don't think that really adds up size-wise. You know, you, you don't you don't have any labels really. You got this, you know, square guy with eyes but no mouth. It kind of throws you off a little bit. What's up with we that? We don't know what to make of this, so this is not really helpful in any form. Um, and it's go, yeah, good. And a lot of the times, these these kinds of charts are everywhere. And once you once you start to kind of get a sense of what a good chart looks like, you'll notice that a lot of people are very liberal with their uh, with their rules and creative licensing. And what it's it's cute, but it's, it's very colorful. But it's not doing the job that a chart is supposed to do. And that is supposed to uh, synthesize data and in and give an insight to your audience so they can understand um, and uh, make sense of a data set. And this is certainly not doing that. Uh, let's go example two here. We have a we have a line graph. That's a little better. We don't just have floating bubbles in space. But what what's the problem? One problem with this one. First thing you see. First, the first thing I saw was there's no y-axis. Number one, we don't know how high it's go, it goes. There's no horizontal lines that could compare uh, what each individual line of data is supposed to be showing, and what about the values on each on each peak and valley? Yeah, we have a range of zero to two percent. We have this bottom line here; it goes up and down, up and down, but it's always zero percent. So, what are we supposed to gain from that? Um, so, just we don't we don't know what what y is presenting. I mean, it's a, some type of percentage, but we don't know exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, so, always if someone just kind of stumbled upon this, they would see, oh, okay, the the lighter blue shade is clearly better, but we don't know anything about what the context is. We don't know if two percent increases means anything it's just not not very uh, not very strong in whatever it's trying to present we don't know there's too much that we don't know about this and that last one uh, we have a bar graph which looks a little more official and we have some highlighting at the top one from CNBC from CNBC so you think a reputable source um, can anyone see one issue with with how these bars are presented it's a lot of numbers it's a lot of numbers yes it's a lot of, of text above the graph which it's going to take you too long to read that and kind of contextualize what we're looking at here. Um, we what see else? the, yeah, what else do we see with kind of the values of each bar? Not proportional. Not proportional. Again, that's one, of the, that's one of the easiest ways to kind of cheat and, and kind of say, oh, we want to show one thing is, is kind of an outlier, which it is, but we have you know, the second bar is 614,000 and, you know, three bars down is 50,000 and they don't really look that different. Right. So. All things that, that as, as writers who sometimes create our own visualizations, sometimes we use others, we really need to keep a, a sharp eye out, kind of be a detective and kind of sift out the inconsistencies, the inaccuracies on, on what visits, that we, is what we call them, and what visits we use in our stories because they can really torpedo any writing that you do. Any beautiful writing, words you put together can all just be discredited with a yeah. kind and of janky viz like this. You learn a lot in school about bias in your writing, and especially as a journalist, that's the number one thing, to be mid as middle of the road as you can and give both sides. And what a lot of people don't realize is that charts, inherently the way you present them, um, there can be a lot of bias in your chart. I mean, here it wouldn't really make sense because they're, they're showing that, that Trump's had some tax issues, so they're not trying to paint him necessarily in a great light. But at the same time, 
um, for if it were a uh, a piece that were uh, trying to, you know, uh, show that Donald Trump maybe didn't was okay financially, then then this would be problematic. It would be showing a very clear bias um, and not really uh, not really representing the data um, in a fair and balanced way. So that's why it's really important. This kind of leads us to other common pitfalls you can have with having data. Um, it can be a good crutch to lean on in your writing. Say, hey, I'm leaning on some facts, some objective numbers, uh, but there's ways to misuse that. Um, as we said, the skewed or misleading charts um, can paint a different picture than what it actually is. Um, another big one is if you, it's, we all have biases and, and preconceived notions, but it's important to not have an idea and then go looking for data that'll only confirm your suspicions. Um, because you know you can find you know, 10 pieces of data. The first eight might contradict what you think is right, but the ninth one could be the one that supports your claim, and you can just leave out the first eight and just focus on that one supporting piece of evidence, and, and that's, that's a little unethical. You know, it's not gonna be an accurate picture for your readers, so we don't wanna do that. Um, it's important to look at the data and have that form your opinion rather than the other way around. And it, it tends to happen a lot because a lot of you are smart and are going in and are going to uh, come come out with a conclusion and say, oh, you know, I think this I think this is the reason, I think this is the factor contributing to this trend when, in fact, there could be a whole mix of factors and you want to make sure that you're not kind of seeing what you want to see. Yeah. And that goes with presenting both sides, not omitting uh, possible contributing factors that could be a cause for whatever it is you're, you're writing about. And then, of course, it goes with anything really, uh, double, triple, quadruple check your numbers because... Yeah, it would it would be a shame for, to have your your whole case laid out or your whole piece written and then the numbers don't add up and then you seem like you don't know what you're talking about. So always important to do that in really anything, but especially if you're dealing with a heavy set of numbers, it can be easy to miss you know miss a decimal point or something like that. Yeah. So. And even reputable sources, the government, um, people who collect data for a living, can have these kind of data errors in them. So you have to put. Your, again, your investigative yep. cap on, your detective's cap, and kind of look through and say, you know what, I really don't think that this mountain is a million feet high. I really think that they wrote, they, that's probably not right. <laughs> I really think that's impossible, and that happens. That happens all the time, um, because working with a lot of numbers can get, uh, can get difficult. Especially for if you're in a position similar to us where we have product people who are kind of the they kind of deal with the really heavy numbers and they, they send it to us and we're, it's kind of their domain, but we can notice an error in their, in their computing. And you know, it's okay to call it out even if you don't kind of view yourself as the numbers person and you're the writer. You can still do that. You can still check your, dot your I's and cross your T's, as yeah. they say. Because they're going to also look at your article. Everybody's, everybody's yeah. got an opinion about, about what you're writing or if you have a mistake or not. So right back at them. Um, so yeah, basically we're just here to tell you that no matter what you're interested in, um, whether it be sports, entertainment, um, you know, politics and health, that uh, data can be a really great way to uh, enrich your story and elevate the discussion within your story. Um, you're able to, just like Sabrina did with her, with her Rio water story, illuminate a new angle. You can, or with the Ghostbusters story, you know, you can see the same a lot of people are writing this the same story and sometimes all it takes is a little bit of a closer look or maybe uh, you know checking two different data points uh, and seeing if uh, seeing if they they work together and it can really open a new door to your story um, and so data is really helpful that way also today anybody can make a website anybody can <laughs> can write an article and there are so many people throwing out facts and throwing out you know, facts and uh, opinions about something. And it's really hard these days to separate fact from fiction. And, uh, and so a lot of people, a lot of readers feel a lot of uh, kind of, they don't trust their, a, a lot of publications uh, anymore. And so it's, it's a lot harder to gain your audience's trust. And that, as a journalist, that's really the only thing that you have. It's your most important currency with your audience is to gain their trust. And so with data, you're able to really back up your points with facts. And it's become, that's why a lot of uh, publications like the New York Times, like uh, Washington Post that has Wonk blog, that's why they have uh, created a special 
column just for data journalism because they know that now audiences crave that more and more. They want to see the numbers to back it up because now you can't just take anybody's um, anybody's words as fact anymore. So it can really help strengthen your article, strengthen the points in your article, and uh, support it in ways that you might have not been able to before. And again, you know, a lot of people uh, just when they think data journalism, they think I was a stats major in that person was a stats major in school, and that's all that they care about is just the numbers, and uh, and they're they're writing about politics or they're writing about econ when that's not necessarily true anymore. Um, and you know, some people feel that the sports and entertainment are the lighter fare, especially entertainment, and that you know keep keep the numbers kind of away from my from my, uh, my leisurely entertainment and sports writing. When sometimes it can, really, uh, it can really be an asset to whatever you write. And you can find a data angle for any story, whether it be the World Series, Brangelina, whatever it is, you can fi uh, find a way to make a really interesting point or draw a really interesting insight with your data. But always remember to use it wisely because it is a weapon but that you can use in your favor and it can be used against you. So that's you and that's the data and it'll help you out. Um, and uh, just to kind of, if you guys are thinking how to go about, you know, becoming more adept at using the data, a um, few tips that we both use in you know, familiarizing ourselves with a lot of statistical analysis, uh, start reading. Um, for me personally, I obviously read a lot about sports in my free time. Uh, I read a lot of articles that are written by writers with heavy uh, stats backgrounds that they it, it'll be you know this long and I only really grasp 40 percent of it because they use a lot of you know blood and guts numbers that are really heavy and just kind of go over my head but if you keep doing that and get some more repetitions in uh, you'll pick up on it little by little whatever whatever arena or whatever field that you are interested in reading about and writing about and you'll you'll get better just by reading things and exposing yourself uh, a favorites of mine are if any baseball people are in the room, uh, a site called Fangraphs is a good tool. They really like to in introduce advanced stats and get you more familiar with it, and so those are good uh, things to look out for. There's also the Upshot, like we've talked about in the New York Times, 538, great stuff that 538 yeah. does um, in from culture to politics. Um, Wonk Blog from uh, the Washington Post. Stat, if you're interested in health uh, news and data. Um, really great site for that. So there's there's some, a little bit of something for everyone in the data world. Yeah. And then another piece of advice is while you're still here, I feel old saying this, there's so many uh, resources at your disposal. Don't take them for granted. I know you guys go to this building every day. It's probably the shock and awe is worn off at this point, but it really is an incredible place. Um, there, are, there are data classes in Annenberg they offer. Um, take a class at Viterbi if you can fit it in your schedule, kind of familiarize yourself, maybe a stats class. You know, just mix it in there and just get yourself a little more comfortable using numbers in your work. And then finally, as Natalie touched on earlier, um, if you have a writing background, a lot of us can think that we're, I'm more of a qualitative person. I don't really think analytically too much. You can be both. It is okay. You can work quali uh, quantitative analysis into your qualitative endeavors and really enrich both in that way. So you don't need to think of yourself in sort of a dichotomy. You can, you can be both. It is okay to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, before we open up questions, if you have any, we just want to both say thank you so much for having us and coming out. We really, really, really enjoy talking to you guys. Uh, it was great to come back. And please, any questions you have, we'll feel free to throw them up here and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There you go. Um, lot, uh, most of our data that our product team gathers is actually publicly available. Um, we, from the White House, um, just public studies that are done. Um, sometimes they do purchase data that's not publicly available, but that's not, it's really not the majority of, of data that we use. It's a lot of it is just, you know, Google can be a great tool, um, but you have to know exactly where, what results you're getting from that. So, um, Health, health. Um, there are lots of really great sources from there that are um, from the government. So uh, the uh, CDC and uh, ESHA, which 
I've never found out what it stands for, but it's just called ESHA, which has nutrition data. And uh, in you know sports, the great thing is there are a lot of people s- sitting on the sidelines collecting <laughs> collecting data. So there are a lot of a uh, lot of sports data sets available. Yeah, for a lot of uh, educational stories, that right, we get a lot of data from the uh, NCES National Center for Education Statistics, um, IPEDS, which is a subset of NCES, which IPEDS, which stands for off the top of my head, I do not recall, but it's it's part it's part of the same uh, same group. And in entertainment, we have um, IMDb gives out a lot of its uh, a lot of its data, and then Grace Note for both uh, movies and music um, gives out data. And there's also uh, Metacritic, which is uh, which I really like because it aggregates a lot of reviews from a lot of reputable sites. Um, but you know, a lot of these uh, you have to you have to go looking for yourselves sometimes because if you, especially if you have a very kind of niche idea, you have to look around. But you can also look at our sites on Graphic, which are great data resources if you you're go. ever interested. Um, we it's Graphic with a Q, just just to reiterate that yeah, part. That's yeah, that's the that's a startup yeah. little little <laughs> vibe for you in there. Yeah. But yeah, we have uh, a, a lots of different websites even pet breed data and you can go in there and uh and look for data uh, data through our websites as well so we have a really big knowledge graph is what we call it a lot of entities and data fields that are connected to each other and what graphic does really uniquely is that we connect we have all of our different data sets and we connect them to each other so if you're looking at hillary clinton we'll tell you about hillary clinton we'll also tell you about uh, her alma mater that she went to. I also talk about the the stats of uh, she went to Yale, right? New Haven. I think so. um, yeah. That and the stats about the uh, about the place and about the economy of that place and who governs it and who is a senator there. So it's all all kind of structurally connected. So. Good question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. This yeah, was like super interesting stuff. Um, I was just wondering, like, do you guys ever? I guess get requests from either the government or other companies to make visually appealing data sets for them. Like I'm picturing maybe like Time Warner wants a graph of like how each of its HBO shows do over a period of a certain amount of time or like per season or if the government wants something with all the data that they have or is it just your own ideas? We, we get some custom requests for sure. Um, usually, if if a if a publication or somebody wants a data set to be presented, we'll usually have it on hand. It's it's not a, it's uncommon that we don't have data, or we don't have anything already made. But we do get people who say, hey, or we've already worked with them on other things. Maybe they say, hey, you guys, we like your product. We don't see this. Can you make it for us? And the, our product managers are, are wizards. They can just whip it up very very quickly. Yeah, we had a. a, a some kind of government branch site i'm not really sure what it was but it's we had for a while a deal with them where we um had a visualization we call them detail visualizations for people it just it's like a picture of them and then it, it has um info about general them. overview type of thing. right and that we had that for uh different uh members of congress so we had that embedded on the sites next to there we also yeah. have um, deals right now with a construction company that's in Santa Barbara, which is where Graphic is, right. uh, called Procore, and we visualize uh, uh, home uh, home value data for them and do mm-hmm. like a what we call like a market health uh, rating for them. So we'll we'll have a visualization that refreshes constantly, um, and it'll show the the health of a certain uh, the uh, real estate health of a certain area. Um, neighborhoods, cities, those types of things. Right. So, yeah. And right now we have a deal with AP where when they, uh, before they put something through the wire, they'll they'll see if they can find a graphic visualization that'll match um, their news event and then they'll send it to everyone. <laughs> they'll send it to everyone to use in their stories. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, lots of different ways to use the visualizations. And as a regular person, you can embed our visualizations for free into your yeah. stories, which are... A helpful tool. This is a really weird question, but sure. Um, Let's hear it. Yeah. Is it really? It sounds like it's a really creative, collaborative kind of environment. Can you just tell us a little bit about what it's like to work where you work, and, and what you, what are the strengths and weaknesses you think of that versus like going 
Hmm? Well, um, this is really my first full-time job, so I can't compare it to too many other things. Uh, but working at a startup has been really great. Um, it's a lot, very energetic vibe. Um, a lot, you know, for us, we're, we're the writers. We kind of feel like, you know, small fish in a big pond, so to speak. Everyone else is very, very technically trained. A lot of engineers, a lot of product people. Um, but the, the cross-collaboration really just kind of, it just kind of raises your awareness and your understanding of different things that you wouldn't, that I wouldn't imagine ever having like knowledge of how, you know, these, this data is collected and put together and how to use it. Um, that's something that's, that's been really, really refreshing for me and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so sweet. much. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's really interesting as a uh, classically trained words person to be working with somebody who is the has basically the opposite mindset who is a mostly a data person and who doesn't know so much about words so it's a really interesting collaboration because you have all these story ideas and you're basically working with this person to see like what can match and you're always learning from them um, they're learning from us how they're their readers um, and they they follow what's going on in the news and they you know have never worked really with in the world of journalism before so we can help them with um, best practices for stories or saying you know uh, uh, one thing that happens a lot is we'll we'll write a story we'll write how um, we did our methodology for example for a ranking you know how we ranked the best pitchers um, and then we'll uh, what the the product manager will talk to us about how we came up with that ranking and we'll we'll write it and then the product manager will say you know I um, you didn't uh, you didn't put in this uh, this little tidbit about you know how we uh, how we made this part of the methodology that's very technical and us as journalists we can come in and say you know um, as though that is an important part of the methodology for our audiences that's not um, they don't need that extra piece of information like this is our job is to really explain it in a very kind of easily digestible way and that's not you know that's not necessary so that's kind of the back and forth that we have where we say okay is this is this a really important factor to mention should we put this in do we not need it can we take it out and so we both add something to the table and we learn from each other which is really cool mm -hmm. anything else my last piece of advice, if you're really interested in this and don't have the bandwidth to take a class or whatever, is to poke around Excel for a while. Excel has been, is in data, in visualizing data is, seems daunting, but it's a really useful tool. And um, in Excel, you can learn how to make your own graphs and you can make pivot tables in there. So I would really recommend um, getting to know Excel very well. Um, and getting to and work with it a little bit because that it's a it's a really great tool. Um, we're lucky enough at our job we have they put on workshops to help us with that. But that's something that you can absolutely find online or learn from your friend who works in who works in Viterbi or whatever you want to do. But it's definitely a great resource. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys again for Thanks. coming. We really had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. I think it's fun. I don't have a quick time. Thank you so much.